Whoa, freezing. Hello YouTube, this is gonna be, what is this? The third episode, fourth episode in the, uh, the Java chess application. And this episode is going to be fully focused on the move class. So we're done with the, the view, I went over that earlier. So now we're into the, the model package. So one of the most important classes in this package is the move class. So without further ado, let's get going. The, it's a really interesting class because it uses what's called the builder pattern, which is a way to do a number of things. It's a way to keep a function, I mean a class. So if you have a class that has a ton of members, you know, attributes, and you, you don't want to have a really long constructor, you know, uh, some infamously long constructors I've called, you know, you call a constructor on a buffered image in Java and you have to pass in maybe a image observer so you pass that in and then the next nine things you pass into the function are ints, integers. So how are you supposed to know, you know, it's just a really bad way of, of writing code. So the builder pattern tries to avoid avoid that and it also tries to make actually succeeds in helping you to write an immutable class with um it's a way to have a um it's really hard to explain you have a complex class so you have these two these are the only two variables that have to be instantiated and have to be included in the class all of these others are optional and yet I'm able to have them all be final and have the whole object be immutable and the way I do that is with the builder pattern. So let me just go ahead and show you the move class itself has a private constructor. It means that any other class can't call the constructor and create a new move object. They have to do it a separate way. So the way this constructor works is you pass in a builder. Uh, maybe I should go over the builder class first. Public static class builder. So it's a nested class. And here we have our required parameters and these are final and then we have our optional parameters later and these are um, not final they're mutable and I guess I should go over a little bit of what the move class is it's a object that wraps an origin and a destination at and a piece type at minimum so what it's able to do is when you click you know when the user makes an input to specify a move they want to make that input gets all wrapped up into a move object and that move object gets sent to the the model sort of the the innards of the program and what that program then does is it takes the these two these two um, variables and looks at them and then using its knowledge using the knowledge of the board that it has that the view doesn't is it, it's able to fill in all of all of these members so it's able to determine if the move is legal if it's a capture move if it's placing the king in check if it's a promotion move and if so what the type of promotion is if it's a castle queen side castle king side if it's a checkmate if it should include the rank and th that's a notation issue so I won't, I won't go over that but that's how I'm using the class in my program I pass in a sort of empty move object into the the board class and then what that board class does is through a function called refine move and if it'll load it's it's a big class so it's going to take some time to load it's 1244 lines of code but through this refine move function what it does is it takes a move object that has the bare minimum specified origin origin slot and piece to move and it um, fills in all the gaps, tells it whether it's a castle queen side, king side, all of these things, and then it returns the refined object. And I'm able to do this while keeping the move class completely immutable the whole time. So the way that's done is with the builder pattern. So I'll go ahead and show the use of the builder pattern. Maybe that's an easier way of explaining how it works. What I do is when I want a new move object, I create a new move builder. So move.builder, I call it B is equal to new move.builder and I pass in the three required parameters 
and I say that it's legal because if this function is called, it um, you've already assumed that the move is legal. See in the documentation for it, I've written this method ignores the legality of the move and absolutely assumes that the move is legal, right there. So by saying b dot is legal, what that means is we're setting a flag. And then when we come down here and we call builder dot build, let me go back to the builder class. It has a build function that returns a new move, passing itself into the constructor. So, and, and as you remember, the constructor is a, a private constructor that takes a builder and it basically just copies all of the builder's attributes onto itself, and it's able to make them final. So the builder class is immutable, but then when we hit build, we get an immutable move class, move object, excuse me. So we, we go through all these things, we call these functions I've written, is move castle kingside, we pass in the move and the team we're wondering about, and then if so, we set the flag on the builder that it is. If it's a capture move, is what this if block determines, we say builder.capture move, we set that flag. If it's a check move, we say builder.check, and then these disambiguate. Yeah, that's that's a very clear word. What this does is in standard chess notation, sometimes you include the rank and file of a piece when it moves, and sometimes you don't. So for instance, when when I just move a pawn, if you look over in the, the move list here, why is this off center? I need to fix that. That looks so messy. But you see e4. It didn't say pawn e4, so it didn't have a p there. Or when I move here, bishop c4, it didn't say which bishop because only one bishop can go to c4. But if I were to move a rook, let's say if this back rank were clear, you can imagine it was white's turn, and two rooks could have moved to this square. I need to specify which rook did so. So that's the whole idea of disambiguating, and, I, and that would... I would specify it in the notation. So I have a couple of tests here. You know, if it's a pawn in a capture move, we need to include the rank. If it's a knight or a rook, we need to include the rank, because knights and rooks are pretty commonly able to move to the same squares, as opposed to bishops. Two bishops can never move to the same square as each other. Two bishops on the same team, that is. So that's the idea behind the disambiguate section. So then we return b.build, which returns an immutable move object. So someone using this function doesn't know about the builder. It, they don't know about this whole immutable or immutable thing. They, they're just passing in a move and getting returned an uber move, and they don't know the difference. So that's what's beautiful about the builder pattern. So one other thing that this class does is there are a couple of... I don't need, I don't need to include these uh, accessor methods because I have all of these as public. It's another advantage to an immutable class. If your class is immutable, you don't need to protect your variables. You can just make them public because you know that no one can tamper with them. So I don't need these anymore, but I'm not sure which classes that I wrote before I changed this um, still use these fun these methods, so I'm going to leave them in for just a while. But I uh, know that I don't need them. So now I have this function, to algebraic spring string and what this does is it takes a move any move object and converts it to its standard algebraic notation which is what you see in the move list on the right and I really need to stop closing the program because I just have to launch it again and I lose time so what this function does is you call it on a move object and it returns a string so when I called when I called get algebraic string on the move e2 to e4, it returned this. When I call get algebraic string on that move, that's what it returned, that e5 right there. So when I call it on this move, that's what was returned. If I were to make a move that put the king in check, see, we get the plus at the end of it, which is the notation for check. So the, the brains behind that is in this two algebraic string function. So if it's a castle king side, that's what we return. That's the symbol for castle kingside. And I go ahead and have the return statement here so that I don't have to run all these ifs. Just a way of saving a little bit of time. 
And once we get through that, we create a new string builder. And that's kind of like our, our canvas on which we write the, we build the move. We build the string, excuse me. So if it's a pawn, a pin, nothing, because you don't, sometimes you put P for pawn, but it's really uncommon and it's not the standard notation. So if it's a pawn, a pin, a blank, I could have left that. This line of code literally does nothing. So maybe remove it, I don't know. Anyway, if it's a knight, append n. The reason you use n for knight is because k is king, so that's just that's just the way they do it. If it's a rook r, bishop b, queen q, king k. If should include rank. Should include rank is... Oh, right, the, the, the logic is not here for should include rank. That's the logic for whether it should include the rank is actually right here. Just so you know, if it's a pawn, it's a capture move, let's go ahead and include the rank. Or if it's a knight or a rook, let's go ahead and include the rank. So if so, if whoever made the move object set that flag, well, at this point we're going to append the origins x, uh, x value. So that's going to be the rank of the move. Is the, the origin, if you can imagine, the origin is the move, is the uh, originating square where we're moving from. I quit the program again. And the rank is, of course, its x value. If should include file, we're going to include the origin's y value because that's the file that it's on. Actually, I might have that mixed up, but it works. So anyway, is capture move. So if it's a capture move, we're going to append x. That's how capture moves are notated. Instead of a space between the origin and the destination, we have an x. If it's not a capture move, do nothing. See, once again, I think this is a useless bit of code. Let's go ahead and remove our useless code, and hopefully, when we run it, we won't have any problems. I could, I could completely remove that. Anyway, for the sake of neatness, I'll keep it. So now, no matter what, we're going to append the destination dot two string, and what we're doing here is we're calling two string on a coordinate object, which returns the chess string. So. The coordinate was 5, 4, this is going to return, you know, C6 or, you know, knight to F4. It's going to be the, the chess notation. And then if it's a promotion move, we append the equals and then what it promoted to. And if it's a check move, we append that plus at the very end. If it's a checkmate, we append the, the pound symbol. And then we return uh, string builder dot to string. So, um... I think that's it for the move object, I mean the move class, so I didn't go over this part of the builder object. These are just functions, builder promotion type, yeah, so what these do, these these are what, uh, that's what these are calling right here, b.check, b.castlequeenside, b.castlequeenside. What we're doing is, when we call that function, we're just... Let's say when we call castle kingside, we're setting that flag to true. And then returning the builder object. I think these could actually be void. They might they might actually be supposed to be void. But anyway, that does it for the for the overview of the move class. If you have any comments or questions about the builder pattern, um, feel free to leave leave a comment or send me a message. Uh, thanks.